Good morning, everybody. We are doing exactly what we said we would do. We're driving down to Barrow. We asked you guys your questions. Jesse hit us with the first question. Yeah, so we're gonna start on the short you put up and then I'll just go sort by newest first, scroll to the bottom. So we've got the very first comment someone made. What do you eat to stay lean and fit? Chris, what have you been eating recently? What's on the, what's your, what's your day like? What's my day like? Good question, yeah. Start with, start with porridge, uh, with bananas. Uh, I don't really have much coffee around that period, probably a cup of tea. Oh, actually, you know what I do? I do have some egg white protein to start the day, just an egg white protein mix. What do you mean water. mix, like a powder? A powder, powder. Oof. Yep. <laughs> It's just, it's totally tasteless. Okay. Totally tasteless, especially if I've done a decent session the day before. Do that, lunch, tuna wrap, uh, chicken wrap, something like that, um, and dinner. Dinner is, for us in our house, pretty um, barbecue, something protein on the, that's what I'll do, like salmon, chicken, meat, um, some sort of thing like that, or uh, a lentil, lentil pasta, something like that, and Elizabeth will do, normally do some veggies and stuff inside, otherwise I'll do, do all that. It's pretty, really boring. Pretty standard, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, um, what do I do? Uh, so, breakfast, I've been having the same breakfast since I got back from Europe, actually. Cornflakes, an orange, big bowl of cornflakes with soy milk, an orange, and some yogurt. Uh, lunch, I've been doing, I've got, I've got lots of inspo from my Europe trip, actually, mm -hmm. with the foods, I've been doing like, Toaster sandwiches with like um, pesto, a bit of garlic sauce, um, bocconcini, cheese, um, piece of tofu, tomato, and maybe some mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So just, yeah, toasted sandwich. And yep. then dinners, usually um, like pasta. So like a pumpkin tortellini thing with just some pesto and some, and then like just dissolve, literally dissolve like a bag of spinach in it. That's the standard snacks. Um, like those protein yogurt things. Are you a pasta or a rice family? No, definitely pasta. Yeah, we're a rice family. Because a stir fry, for me, like a stir fry is like, okay, it's got lots of veggies, it's kind of good, but it's not like delicious. Whereas a pasta, oh, no. a pasta is like, oh, yeah. White rice, I could literally just eat white rice. Any of that. With this soy sauce, beautiful, beautiful. Um, yeah, so we're, we're, we'd run like chicken, chicken, rice, and beans with some veggies. Is a, is a staple in our house, genuine staple. Um, I think people would probably be surprised with, from, with my diet, the actual how much food I eat. Like, it's a lot of food, um, but I, the only thing that I do watch is the amount of fat that I put in my food. So if I'm having like a big bowl of um, porridge, I don't whack buckets of peanut butter in it or something like that. I think that's maybe where some people can kind of get a bit carried away. Mm. Um, even with like avocado on toast, like I've seen people have like an entire avocado on a slice of toast and be like, oh, this is a super, super clean, like lean meal. I'm like, eh, it is, there's but a lot of fat in there. Calories, yeah. Like, so that's, that's my thing is like, if I'm starting to feel bloated or anything like that, I'll, I'll just cut the, the fat out of, the, out of those meals. Nice, yeah. Um, Oh, I'm also on a sourdough sourdough kick. Oh yeah. From yeah, when we were just um, when I was over in France and everyone would get their nice breads, I got this little hankering for for nice bread. So you make do my toasted sandwich. I uh, I haven't. I've made my own like pizza doughs. I've been doing that and made my own focaccia. Haven't got into the sa well. You need starters. It's a bit of work, mm. but definitely like I'll pay for. I'll pay. <laughs> I'm in a Waterloo Redfern, so I, you know you can get what an you, expensive what, nine, life. Nine dollars, yeah. ten dollars. You can. Uh, let's yeah. not. Let's not look. Let's go, not go down that road. Right. <laughs> it's worth it. I love yeah, it. It's delicious. Yes. Um, okay, so Chris, do frame stiffnesses claimed by the manufacturer, mm -hmm. so ten percent stiffer, fifteen percent stiffer each year. Yep. Is that real? And can a pro yeah. rider really feel it? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. I don't, so what nine times out of 10, what they're basing that on is this jig that they all use at these factories. I've seen, I'll see if I can find the footage and maybe dump it in here. You potentially have seen that before, but it's this jig that literally like throws the bike around, like it's doing this sort of stuff and that sort of stuff. And it's measuring the tolerance of the frame 
um, in those particular circumstances. Now, I remember when we were working with Devel on the A02, they were sending me all the data readouts of this. Now, it didn't mean anything to me, but he was telling me exactly that stuff. Like, oh, it's gone up 2%, oh, it's gone down 3%, all this kind of stuff. But of course, where that is, where it becomes like, how long is a piece of string? It's like, well, where is the stiffness? Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it might be stiffer in this particular um, part of the frame, but does that have a trade off to that particular part of this, the frame? And from what I understand, I don't really know if there is a, a metric or a good way that they've been able to, to, to identify that. Mm. So yeah, so I mean, is that real? I mean, yes, if you're objectively measuring something stiffer, it's a, you know, it's, yes, it's, it's objectively real. Can pro riders feel it? This is where I have a thing where I'm like, you can feel something. Does that make a difference to your speed on the road? Mm -hmm. You know, probably not. I mean, you can feel when a frame is stiffer or is less stiff, mm -hmm. but I'm like, are you really going to be performing slower going slower on the road because your frame isn't as stiff in that way i mean it might not feel as good but unless you know, most of the frames these days have been good for decades yes like the old you know tarmax from 10 15 years ago were already performing fine from a stiffness point of view so i um, do think stiffness gets um does get uh, lost with the other word compliance yeah so Whereas something can be can be really really stiff, which is a, which is a good thing. You do want the frame to be stiff, and yes, I do think you can feel that. But more than that is the way that affects the compliance. And compliance, for me, is the way is really how that you're feeling the road through the bike. You know, something can be super super stiff, but it's the it's the the effect that has on. The, the frame as it's traveling across bumps and lumps and that kind of stuff that's the real the real thing that you can feel quote unquote which means I reckon you're going to start to see some sort of metric around this is now seven percent more compliant good luck but they do yeah they do say that oh they do yeah, yeah. they already yeah. That, do. that that's oh, more vertical pretend. compliance or that's whatever that's a completely it is. pretend number yeah yeah but I don't I mean so yes it's real but Saying it's stiffer and stiffer and stiffer every year, it's just, I don't know. I don't think it makes a difference. Who's doing more for cycling? Justin Williams with his Legion project Was or it? Lachlan Morton with what he's doing in lower socioeconomic countries? Was it just uh, who's doing more Who's for? doing more for cycling? I must admit, I'm not up to speed with what Lachlan No, doing. nor am I. I, I, I think with the, I've seen photos of him. He does those sort of, I think he was touring... Maybe he did a tour through maybe one of the African countries with something with EF maybe. I swear I saw a photo. That's what that's getting at. Uh, who's doing more for cycling? Hmm. You know, well. Who's more generous, Mother, Mother Teresa or Gandhi? Like, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, look, in my, in my, I suppose, my um, first... You can play a, a drinking game here. How many times has Chris can use the word bubble? In, in my bubble... Probably Justin Williams is a more um, is a bigger force, I suppose, in in what's going on in cycling. Um, but that's just me. That was an incredible lane yeah. change. I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, especially, especially, I think once this uh, million dollar crit series kicks off, I think there's there's going to be a lot of stuff happen. No, no, we'll go to the next one. Oh. Um, there'll be a lot of stuff happen in behind that. Um, especially around inner city uh, kids and that kind of thing. So you're going to see that. I know, having spoken to some of the people at Rafa, that's going to be a big deal uh, in 2023. Yeah. I, I don't... Th but the thing with Justin Williams is when you say he's doing something for cycling, I, I think it's more in terms of making that section of the sport culturally cooler in like a hype sense as opposed to what he's supposedly doing with his team, which is oh, that's for, for black... You know, for black um, cyclists, and even though half the team's not black, so I think you can be a fan of what he's doing for the culture of the sport without what he's doing with the you know the fundraising for his team and all that. So there's, there's a point there. Uh, hey, Chris and Jesse. Hey, Justin. What is a realistic FTP gain goal? Oh, can you say the names when you read them out? Sure. Yep. Justin Munyard. What is a realistic FTP gain goal over three months of training? 
I would say I am no longer a beginner. Good question. Um, <laughs> speaking of pieces of string, mm. um, I don't know. <laughs> I, can we just skip it? I don't even want to give a number. It could be 2%, it could be 10% on a given power duration. Right, FTP just... gain, oh, FTP gain goal. I mean, yeah, in three months, you could get from three, uh, from 280 to, to 295 in three months. It's possible. 15 watts. You could also gain five watts. You could, so you could also gain 20 watts. You know, it's possible. What's the most you've seen as a coach? Um, uh, <laughs> not to pump up my own tires, yeah. I intended. Yep. Since I've gotten back from Europe, where I had a big D training period, I've put on 40 watts to my FTP in two months. What's the least you've seen, but it hasn't, like, you're, you're, it's not concerned you. The, the rider is doing the, doing the sessions and is following, and you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're content with the way it's progressing. What's the least you've seen? Least I've seen would be nothing. No improvement, and there's and, and even train like so. We're going to Barrel Classic. There's riders here that will perform better at this event that in the last three months probably haven't seen an improvement at their FTP, but they're going to do the event a lot faster for other reasons. Yep. So yeah. So nothing you can. Yep. Yep. I think that's a great point. I don't know. what don't want to sidetrack this too much, but I said this to you the other day. Like I'm the fittest I've been in Yonks, and that probably hasn't seen a raise in my FTP. What it has seen is my ability to repeat and my recovery from repeating efforts is just phenomenally better than it was. And that's where I'm, I've seen gains in my, in my own fitness. Mm. Yep. yep, spot on. Uh, so, Pillows B. Pillows B, hey Chris and Jesse, is Nero going to be racing in the Tour of Tasmania this year? No. Nope. Um, will this year's Nero kit be for sale? Yes, Love we, the have, design. we have uh, a few pieces left over. Um, we have a few contractual things that sort of, the way this sort of works with, with Rafa, um, it's something that we want to we want to do. But honestly, it's something I wanted to do at the beginning of the year, but we got pushed back from them. That Essentially, they didn't think there was a, a market for it. So I'm still super keen to try and do that. And I can tell you right now, being this far behind financially with the team in 2022, any additional income we can bring in from that perspective would be useful. Read between the lines there. Yes. Uh, Ryan Musset. Hey both. Howdy Ryan. I have recently had my first child, congratulations, and have gone from a lengthy structured training five days a week, all outdoors, to training on my commute. So about 30 minutes give or, each way, give or take. What would be your advice to stay on top of my game on this season? I often do zone two in the morning and then I kind of have a bit of a free-for-all going home. So I just don't know what to do for 30 minutes. I love it. I, I would say you're, if you're doing a 30-minute commute to and from work every day, you're probably already 90% of the way there, mm -hmm. just from the volume alone. Yep. And some of those commutes you've said you sort of maybe you're going for an average speed target, that sort of thing. I think you're already well, well on the way. I'm going to the farm. <laughs> I've just it's, started it's, driving to the farm. That's literally what I've done. We, I haven't even paid any attention to where we're going. I did point out. You did? Yep. Yep. And we've added, oh dear, we've added a lot of time. Yeah, I've, We've sorry. literally just, we've uh, been driving for 15 minutes and we've added. We may pause. Can we pause? 15 minutes. We need to pause. I need to actually concentrate where I'm going. Because I need well, to turn around. <laughs> um, yeah, pause. I need to work out what I'm doing. Uh, uh, just uh, here, I'm pretty sure. Uh, carrying on, uh, where were we? So yes, I think you're probably you're probably 90 percent there. So what what would be advice to stay on top of the game? My advice would be don't stop doing what you're doing. What you're doing will will keep you in pretty good shape. Um, that's an hour a day. That's five. That's that's five hours midweek plus then a longer ride on the weekend. You're then at eight easily at eight to 10 hours sort of thing using the weekends. So uh, that's fine. Just don't, just try and be consistent with it. I wouldn't suggest doing anything. You don't need to really do anything on top of that. Uh, anything to add there, Chris? 
Um, well, not training wise, but just yeah. yeah, like logistically, obviously trying to to manufacture a couple of a bit more time uh, around the house. Whether that's potentially um, well, no, it's 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 how long is a piece of string there? Your own specific circumstances of trying to get help in to look after the the young one and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Best, uh, so Alan asks, best best value for money, high quality clothing brand. So I'm guessing that's kit, kit brand. Um, best value for money, high quality. Um, these questions of like, best value, like what is, what is your price, right? like, do you know what I mean? Like I yeah. find when people ask about, you know, a, a mid-range this or a, a exclusive range of that. I don't know what your idea of the amount of money you're willing, you regard as good value. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, Jesse just did uh, some kit through, a uh, custom kit through AliExpress, right? Not Ali, Alibaba. Alibaba. Yeah. And it's fine. It's good. Like, it's going to work for you, right? Is that good value? It's fantastic value. Like it's great value, and you'll probably get a you know good good year out of it, and then it'll probably disintegrate. I don't know whether that's the kind of value value you want. Um, I'm just not really answering this question, am I? Well, and well, uh, and value is in yeah, but then also you can't really go and, you can't just go and buy that anyway because it's customized, so that doesn't really apply. But it's like. You know, Rafa protein. Anyway, I'm just gonna because you know stuff can be expensive and still be good value if it lasts properly. So uh, okay, I don't well, really know. I haven't really. What I will say is always try and spend money on a a really good pair of bib shorts, shorts that you trust. You know, well obviously I'm a big fan of the of the Rafa ones. Just do make sure that you are getting stuff that is pre-dyed lycra so it's not white on the inside that always makes it last longer and then with your jerseys like I, it, it's much of a muchness to be honest with you um, I I used to ride the Tonelli stuff back in the day and I never had a problem with that I thought that was a really good brand I know most of their stuff is a is a custom thing um, but I've never had a problem with Tonelli yeah but their stuff just comes from China too so. exactly so uh, it's, it's yeah <laughs> well, we're probably not the best people to ask because I haven't used all the lower price point brands, so I don't know, essentially. No. Yeah. Um, ben asks, pre-race tips specifically with timing of food beforehand, but also just tips in general. Maybe touch on differences with morning races versus afternoon races. Uh, timing of food. Uh, when I get nervous, I, I tend to lose my appetite. So, um, whatever tastes good, really. Like, generally uh low fat before before a race and just whatever like sometimes even i'll just have like a, an up and go or even just some lollies or banana like whatever is simple just because i usually don't feel like eating a, what will you have meal. tomorrow morning tomorrow morning probably in the race starts at six thirty, so i'll probably get up and then it'll probably be a small bowl of cereal and an up and go or some toast and an up and go um, afternoon race, just eat normally and then, yeah, usually toast is my mm. sort of go-to if I was doing like a Saturday afternoon heffron. Yep. Um, what are you going to have for breakfast tomorrow? Yeah, I, I found, um, so just, just on this sort of generally, that I, the, the, the further out I can eat before an event, the better. Like, there's no two ways about it for me. It does seem to take me a long time to, especially if I'm, I'm fueling up for a ride for something like tomorrow, I'll... I'll really want to try and get up probably before five, maybe around five, and just shovel shovel some food in, some, some porridge in as quickly as possible. Yeah, so I'll try and have that as far out as possible. And then just before the event or just before the race, I do actually really like something really sugary. Like, it just sort of, like, sparks me up, um, kind of gets, gets me going. That might be some lollies, um, yeah something like that and just to get that in the mouth almost especially if it's it's going to be sort of an intense race from the very beginning um, that's kind of my little technique I suppose 
Cool. Ryan says, tips for a solo rider planning to go race in Belgium. Um, okay, tips for a solo rider. I would say uh, save up money. Don't go over there without... Don't go over there with like loose change trying to... It's too hard. You need you need money because stuff probably will go wrong. So do that. Um, f- try and get a car, I would say, especially if you're going to be racing in different areas. It is just terrible to have to catch trains somewhere and then you, you gotta catch, you, then you get off the train in some te- place in Belgium and you've got to ride to the start of the Camis. It's just a battle. Like if you can work and get money up so you can get a car over there, I think it's worth it. Um, equipment wise, again, it costs money, but try and have spares. So whether you can organize a spare bike or just have money because you're probably gonna have some mechanical issues. Um, is it worth trying to like, are good. is it possible to set up a bit of a relationship with bike shops over there or is that are you a relationship. just another well you're just a customer yeah. I mean yeah you got to know where a good hopefully you've got a good there's plenty of bike shops around there so you'll be able to find a helpful bike shop but everything costs money and you're paying in euros so if you're not from yeah obviously you're traveling so if you're from the US you're alright if you're an Australian going over there it's very expensive um, just with the currency uh, anything else <laughs> pretty much everything I said is just have enough money because it's not fun going over there and you're like scrounging dollars here and there. It's, it's brutal. Um, I would also say fitness wise, have enough, ha, ha, do enough volume of training. Like people kind of think, oh, I'm going over and doing lots of sort of camisas, so I need to do a lot of high intensity work. And I don't, you'll get that naturally in the first, you know, couple of weeks from the racing you're doing mm. but you'll really kind of fall in a heap if you don't have that a, a good general aerobic sort of conditioning going over there um you know we saw that with when when ben carmen trained for it when our trip when he was over there he didn't it's like he went over there flying with um form he just had had done a um a good month or two of volume aerobically was going pretty well and then he kind of raced himself into really good shape and then was getting great results after that I think the guys that came in, um, having done a bunch of really intense training, just sort of went downhill as soon as they got over there. Uh, anything to add on that one, Chris? Having never done it, no. <laughs> okay. Um, make friends too. You need to make friends because, like, especially if you're going over and racing, the camisas can be really long, so you need someone to feed you. So you're gonna have to have a, you're gonna have to know someone over there that will, is willing to go and stand on the side of the road and hand you bottles. I will say, good on you. Like, have a bloody crack and rip in and don't care what people say back where you come from. That's my only comment. Like, I I hated this attitude of, like, people saying, like, oh, he went over but he didn't make it, quote, unquote. Or, yeah, he got eaten up. Like, you're going over there, you're having a crack. They're the ones staying at home doing nothing, judging you. Just don't listen to them and go over and have some fun, man. Yeah, I 100% second that. Or they're like, or he just like paid his way to go over there as an yeah. individual. He's not even on a team. It's like, yeah, but it doesn't matter. You're over there racing. So, yeah, yep. don't worry about that. Okay, XYYX says, how much does a UCI Conti team cyclist earn? In Australia, Oops. minus dollars. You, yeah, minus dollars because most, yeah, you might be paying like a rider contribution fee. Uh, in Europe, though, on some of the good Conti teams, you could get a bit of a... I struggle to call it a salary, like a, maybe an allowance you sort of get. Maybe, you know, 10,000 10, euros, maybe. Um, you know, you can get a bit of money. Uh, my ultimate dream is to cycle and get paid. Just curious if being part of a Conti team will cut it. Okay. <laughs> We've chatted about this before. If you want to do that, just get a job that is flexible and do what the previous person is doing, the amount of time, it's like, why would you train your ass off if your goal is just to get a bit of traveling in and race your bike? Going, trying to get on a Conti team that will pay you is like the most long-winded, roundabout way to do it. If you want to do that, just get a job, earn money, and then go and do it yourself on your own terms, um, and you sort it. A bit, well, a bit depends on where you live, my friend. Like, if you live in Europe, then yeah, that sounds like a, a really sustainable way to do it because you'll probably get a stipend, you'll be able to live there, 
not far from home, your costs will be covered, and you can do some racing. If you live, yeah, in but a... you're probably not going to be good enough. No, well, and like saying that, that, not saying that arrogantly, but like just as a matter of statistics, you're probably that person commenting is probably not good enough to get paid on yeah. a Conti team. Yeah. That's just the reality of the numbers. Yeah. Anyway, whereas if you're if you're Australian, American, do what the other guy did, ignore, just go over, get some money, go over, race your bike, like. Yeah, exactly. Uh, levers inwards, yes or no for aero gains? Asks Elmar. I'm a big yes. I've got the levers in for the aero gains. Chris? Uh, I I would actually prefer to run... So I'm running 40 mil bars at the moment I and got them in a little bit. I'd prefer to run 38s and just be kind of normal. That's sort of my, my take on it. I'd prefer, I've run 36s in the past. Um, which were okay, didn't actually cause me that many issues. But yeah, I kind of would prefer to just narrow the bar rather than doing the full lever setup. It's because Chris is old, so he doesn't do it, isn't it? Yep. Not with the cool kids. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dave B says, hey guys, if training for both crits and an event like Peaks Challenge, what would be best to focus on? They are obviously very different events. Ah, yeah. Do both and have fun with it, mate. Yeah. Like. Train, well, you're gonna have to tra- like. <laughs> Peaks obviously takes priority because the fitness you get from that will, in a roundabout way, help your crits. But it's not necessarily the other way around. Um, problem with Peaks is it's so long. Like, if it was for the tap and it's five or six hours, it's you could kind of go, yep. But Peaks is like for most people is ten, eleven. Like it's brute. Like yeah, the carry over there is uh, <laughs> it's pretty stretched out. What would be best to focus on? Just focus, focus on, I would say focus on peaks. It'd be way more rewarding in terms of a, a challenge. Like it's almost, it's almost like a once in a lifetime kind of thing to do, epic event. Focus yeah. on peaks and then just do crits for fun. Yep, I agree. Training. Especially at this point of the year, like unless you're doing peaks every year and it's just like you're gonna try and, it's just the, the thing that you do. But like Jesse said, it's, it's a pretty iconic thing to, to do target it for a year and then maybe next year just yeah get back into your crit season um yeah it, you are right though it's it's just so long and so hard that there is no i was because i was gonna say like doing crits and doing a bit of training for crits probably isn't gonna hurt your your peaks preparation but it's always like that day after the crit or something like that that you, maybe you wanted, you could have done the long ride or something, but you're so stuffed from the crit mm. that you can't do it, mm. and you probably would have needed those gains from the from the longer ride. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. It's manageable, but yeah, obviously peaks would come first. Angus Wright says, "How do you manage massive appetite?" Uh, I eat a lot of food. What do you do, Chris? How do you manage massive appetite? Okay. Oh, and I don't let myself get too hungry. Like, if I get... Mm. If I have a big meal and then, like, two hours later I'm hungry again, I don't try and, like, ignore it. Like, I just eat. Like, and... <laughs> so, it's not... You just... Yeah. Yeah, that's... That's an interesting one. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to answer that because if... If you're really hungry, maybe you, you just need to eat. Like, do you, do you know what I mean? Like... I don't want to be telling you to sort of starve yourself. Like, there's all the crazy, you know, like the the wives' tales, like the drink... <laughs> was drink sparkling water after a bike ride because mm. it fills your belly with bubbles mm. so you don't eat, and there's all these stupid things like that. Um, please don't do any of that. We don't need to. Imagine the calorie... Imagine the calorie deficit... I'm just thinking, imagine the calorie deficit I would run if I swapped a meal for sparkling water. Like, mm-hmm. I'd be, like bedridden like I can already run a really good calorie deficit without being hungry and with fueling my training why would I skip a meal yeah. like if you're having to do that you just you diet terrible and like I know people say things like you know fatty foods and and high protein foods can feel like you they fill you up I actually quite but in my own circumstance I don't like that feeling so I don't like the feeling of like the a fatty, a fatty meal, and I almost, 
it, it doesn't sit well with me. So I'd prefer to eat a much higher carb, cleaner, quote unquote, meal to, to satisfy my appetite. Um, the only other thing I will say is, and, and especially if we're talking about after a bike ride, that if you've eaten enough on the bike, it's a great way to suppress the cravings afterwards because mm. you won't feel it as much. Yeah, good point. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, check what you're eating on the bike. Maybe you are under fueling and that's what's causing the appetite. Um, I mean, I, I eat pretty high protein now, so that's maybe a bit different. To, I mean, you already have... Yeah, I do you have rely, pretty high protein because yeah, you're eating, you're, you're eating meat. And I so. do rely on protein shakes. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I will have a protein shake. Like if I'm getting the sort of late afternoon um, hunger cranks, I'll probably have a protein shake with maybe a banana in it or something like that. Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll rely on that a bit. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Richard says, should a professional gravel riding competition be set up in Australia like the National Road Series? Um, well, the answer is yes, but uh, we have a lot of issues in this country about organising uh, bike racing. So, yeah, it's... Uh, should, should it be? I don't know. I don't think so. No one really... It's not really a thing here. I feel like it's a... It's build it and they will come. I mean, I mean that Wagga, the, the gears and beers or the dirty 130 thing, that's really popular. I mean, it's not a race. It's a... It's a f- sort of an event, sort of fun event, but I think it's good. I guess that gets a good turnout. Should it? Ah, I don't know. It's cu- quite far down the list of yeah, like, domestic list. things. Yeah. Uh, S- Olek asks, Super 6 Evo rim brake or Trek Madone rim brake? Oh, great <laughs> question. That is good. Okay, and the first thing comes to mind is the brakes on that Trek Madone were a bit... That was the yeah, one that had integrated rim brakes. Yeah. And they were a bit... They had that centre pull yep. cable. Yep. I, oh, I don't know yep. if they were great. The actual braking on them. I think Miles had one of those. He did, yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah, he had them, yeah. And they were, it was pretty heavy too. Super 6 Evo. Oh, Super 6 Evo rim brake. Yeah. Yeah, I, I go Super 6 Evo rim... So I'd go the... Um, the the old uh, African wildlife safari setup. So Super Six Evo rim brake. With was that? NV- yeah, you know, the NRS team. Super Six Evo rim brake. And they had, that's what they set up. And then they had like MVs, but they'd run really deep MVs. And then I'd go with integrated cockpit, aero cockpit. Oh. That's what I'd do. I went around to my cousin's yesterday and he's built up, you know, it had a big crack in the frame, the Specialisma. He got it fixed and he's got it built up with SRAM Red set of envies so this is the specialisma 2016 6.4 kilos Oof. holy crap just beautiful sorry yep oh so we're both on the evo paul freeman thinking about my first set of carbon wheels weekend warrior slash commuter go-to brand model fast sports www.wheelsfar.com I've been using... How long have I been using freaking Fastports? Did my first NRS year on them in like 2017. And they're great. I just don't think you can go wrong at the moment. Like, the fact that you're running you're running tubeless, I'm assuming you're probably going to be running disc. So you don't even have to worry about the braking surface anymore, which was always like the thing to be scared about with carbon rims. You know, it's not even that anymore. Even the Fastports have that textured rim yeah. and it's like, yeah, pretty good. Like, honestly, you can't go wrong. Um... Try, my, my thing would be, like, internal width, go wide. I reckon, like, 23, 24, 25 internal width, go nuts. Yep. Uh, Paul Freeman, what will it take to get Heffron resurfaced? It's a goat track. Um, I don't think it needs to be resurfaced. I don't have a problem with the road surface. It's like the great one. urban myth. Like, it's going to be resurfaced this year. It's going to be resurfaced this year. Heffron uh, is a race, in, uh, our local crit track in Sydney, which is concrete slabs. It's pretty rough. Yeah. No. Nah, don't resurface no, it. Leave it. Nathan, hey guys, thanks for taking questions and comments. Thanks for asking. Couple of thoughts. We all agree that if you want racing analysis, Lantern Rouge is the place to go. Yep. 
He loves to say that teams have shit equipment. Oh, yes. This is something of... Yeah, this is going to be good, I reckon. Unless, of course, you are riding specialised. Okay. What are your thoughts on this? And what teams do you think have the best equipment? Outside of time trials, do you think the bike at that level makes much of a difference? Okay. Also, Jesse, as a coach, what are your thoughts on Zwift as a training tool? Okay. I, I've heard him say this, and it's really annoying. So he says this about... He said this about Israel Premier Tech. He's like, oh, the, it's something along the lines of all oh, the riders are glad to get off that team because they got that equipment disadvantage. I'm like, what are you on about? Like, the Factor Ostro Vam is one of the only 6.8 kilo disc brake bikes in the peloton. And as far as it, everyone else is concerned, it's a fantastic bike. So, and also that team has flexibility to pretty much run whatever they want. Like, Froome's got his decked out just with totally non-sponsor correct bits so I Lantern Rouge is great for racing analysis but I, I agree he doesn't he's, he's yeah I don't agree with a lot of the stuff he says about the equipment special the special I mean he's right like the specialised teams have a good we, we talked about this on our show we talked about it on the show yeah. yeah and uh, Dan was asking um, uh, what's his name Bob Youngles who's yeah. currently on uh, Citron He's going back to a specialised team and he's going to um, uh, direct energy, I think. And like, I got Dan to ask, like, oh, so what did he think of the ki- what are the the equipment like? And honestly, the reply was, it's all fine, it's all good. The only thing going back to a specialised was that it was this, or it was the whole suite of things, and it was you didn't have to, you weren't trying to pick parts from different component companies. It was all kind of coming from the one thing. So there was like this simplicity factor. But as far as just pure performance, at that end, with the, he had, I think they had the BMC with like EPS and DT Swiss wheels. I'm not sure who, what they're running. Yeah. 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 Like superb setup. There was, there was no issues with that. Um, the, actually, the only thing that he did mention was that rumour, well, not rumours, but like, Guys start to talk about certain tyres being good and bad. Mm. So that is something. And that, from all accounts, can like change from like tour to tour and that kind of thing. And you'll see it sometimes. Like a team maybe gets more flats than another team. So that kind of stuff potentially is in there. But as far as like the whole specialised froth, yeah. no. Nah. Time trial's a different ball game. That's less about equipment and far more about time spent in aero tunnels. What those teams, the good teams can do is they will give you time to dial a position in an aero tunnel and you would be shocked to know how few World Tour riders actually get that opportunity. Yep. Um, so, Yombo Visma are going to, to SRAM and all that. We're gonna talk about that. That's a main topic on our show for next week. We're gonna go, we're gonna go into that. Um, UAE are off campy, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go into that in more detail. Uh, as a coach, what are your thoughts on Zwift as a training tool? It's great. Um, oh, actually, Jay Vine responded to this comment saying, "Who? Jay Vine? Hubbards? What's he doing in the <laughs> Hubbards? God, can't we get some? Everyone throws in their fucking here. two cents in here, don't they? So Jay Vine says, "My bikes are all over seven point two kilos, and my truck bike has not been set up in a wind tunnel. That's what is meant." Okay, right. Oh, he's okay. commenting on somewhere else. Yes, he's, no, he's commenting on replying to that comment. Ah, yeah. gotcha. Okay, so good info. So from a contract standpoint, how much does equipment play into a rider selection? Yeah. So he's saying his bike, which is exactly what we said, like his bike is heavier than a factor fan would be. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, Zwift, yep. Uh, everyone knows Zwift is great, but also, uh, you know, whatever whatever indoor platform you want to use, I don't really care. I, just, I don't think Zwift has a specific advantage over any of the other ones like Full Gaz, aside from you can race on it, which some people like. Um, Jay Vine. Uh, <laughs> Hubbard. I, I was like, is someone troll commenting? And it's his profile, so he's asked. Should I make a comeback on the cross country marathon yes. races wherein there is a high altitude and not too technical course in future seasons? Hmm. Mate, no. No, no. <laughs> if you're making a comeback, I've got a list of events that you need to. In fact, we're on our way to the one that Jay Vine. Uh, announced himself on I'll put the link below to the video I did riding with Jay against Jay in this particular event so um, yeah get back get once you come back it's the Fondo scene mate yeah 
Because I've heard rumours about your mountain biking. <laughs> no, yuck. Mountain bike. Don't bother. Ugh. Can we have more animated reacts, lol? Uh, Retzel. Uh, yeah, I think. I'll give you a sure. shout tomorrow, Jay. We'll set up a chat next week. Okay, so what we're going to do now, we're going to move to the main video, not the short, where there's a whole bunch more questions. As usual, I'm going to open it and go newest first, scroll all the way to the bottom. Uh, okay, so someone, there's a few repeated questions. Robert Gow, what do you think of Lantern Rouge and his quality analysis? Best, um, best in the business. Yeah, he, it's fantastic. Um, if I had to, let me nitpick on two things, mm -hmm. just for the sake of balance. He, the equipment thing, which we just discussed, it kind of pisses me off because I just don't agree. Um, and also when he talks about gambling and betting, I don't like. Personally, okay. I'm not a fan of sports betting. I okay. don't think it should have any place in the analysis. Can I, I'd like to talk about this for, um, on the show uh, at some point, but it's an interesting discussion about because neither of them really have any history in the sport. Like obviously no history at the pro level of the sport and barely any at a, like I'm more, um, like achieved more in the sport than, than those guys have, which I think brings up an interesting question because really rare. Most people who are in the sport of cycling were pros and you kind of have to have this was a pro like vibe to have any credibility. And I think he's one of the first to actually show that no, there's, there's nuances to this sport that go beyond what a, a ex former professional cyclist can actually offer so anyway that's a chat i want to have at some point mm -hmm. yeah yep and they still i mean for for two guys for well their podcast for the for those two that are that are doing so well um they still get shit thrown at them like and when they were working for yumbo visma and and it's like there's definitely a lot of jealousy from uh well what appears to be jealousy from um the legacy media in a sense that there was a lot of them were kicking up a stink about it, but I think part of that was just here's something they did wrong, and we kind of love it, uh, which is a bit sad. But yeah, they're they're great. Uh, Vinny asks, do the Nero coaching team have an evidence-based approach to when they recommend training to their clients? If so, where does Nero draw the training recommendations from? Do we have an evidence-based approach? Yes. Uh, okay. First thing is the all the well, it's me and Dan and both of us have, uh, I have a Bachelor of Exercise in Sports Science, um, so I've been to university, so the, the, obviously there's a scientific literacy that comes along with that. Dan is, uh, he's gone beyond that, he's, got, he's a physio, so he's done his sports science, he's done his applied science in physio, and he's also doing his masters in strength and conditioning. So in terms of evidence base, you just, you innately have that because the way we've learnt about biology and physiology and all that is from university, so um, that comes. Uh, and then where do we draw our training recommendations from? Um, experience and what's proven scientifically, evidence-wise. Um, it's more a detail than that as opposed to like someone comes in and we're going to say, well, this study said this, so we're going to make them do that. Like with, pe people aren't lab rats, so um, yeah. Uh, Patrick asks, has Jesse ever coached mountain bikers? I asked you this the other day, actually. Yeah. And my answer was, I've coached people that do a lot of mountain biking, and, and, and but also ride on the road. Most mountain bikers ride on the road as training. Um, I haven't coached a full-on mountain bike only, elite mountain biker, in that sense. Until I, I progress into yeah. that. Uh, <laughs> I would, it's just... At least in Australia, it's just not really that big, the mountain bike thing. And then most of the mountain bikers end up having a mix of road and mountain bike anyway, so, yeah. Um, Benkel Joe says, nice, Boz, very nice. Thanks. B-O-Z? Yep. Yeah. Boz. Squanchy says, what to do about slow stomach or constipation? <laughs> that bar. Bicarb. Okay. There was more, there's more to this question. Uh, or constipation when having to refuel day after day with four to five thousand calories at times as a small rider. That's interesting because you, 
that sort of goes again. I, if you're eating that many calories, usually constipation wouldn't be an issue. No. It'd usually be the opposite. You'd, yeah. you'd get gassy because you're, 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 you're eating so much food. Um, I, I, I don't know. Slow stomach or constipation. I mean, a, ref- I, a lot of that comes down to, I suppose, how you're actually getting those, those calories in. Like, is it quality food? Is there enough fiber in your diet to get things moving? If, good luck eating 5,000 calories with it. That's what I'm kind of mean. Like, who's having mm. 5,000 calories and not getting enough fiber? It's odd. Um, see your GP on that one. Yeah, <laughs> go to the doctor. Go see a diet. Yeah, I don't know. It's beyond my uh, thing. Jonathan says, is the endurance bike dead? I think you have a vlog on that. Yep. Should someone looking to get an endurance bike just get the same level gravel bike and put some skinnier tires on it? So I... But I think just buy a road bike that has wider tire clearance because yeah. most road bikes these days will take 32s. Yep. So um, which is a, so it's an endurance bike. Honestly, I look at the the, the chapter two stuff that I've been riding recently. The to- uh, the tower is the perfect example of that. Like it's marketed as a, a race bike essentially, but it fits fits 32 mil tires on it. It has a drop seat stays, doesn't have the cutout for, for the aero kind of stuff, so it looks it looks like a road bike. And honestly, with 32 mil tires on that, it's absolutely a perfect endurance bike. Yeah, it is. And then, so the part of the other question was, so should I get a gravel bike and put narrower tires on it and get the best of both? I, if you're gonna ride it most on the road, I wouldn't do that, because gravel bikes tend to be quite heavy. So then you'll end up with like a nine kilo endurance bike with narrower tires, which is not going to be fun to ride on the road. Yep. So I don't think that's the good option. So much of this depends on the terrain that you ride in, like where you live. Like for us, that's a no brainer. Like it's always going to be road first. If you live in Colorado, in Aspen, then it's you're going to lean to the gravel side of it. Like if you live in a metro area, lean towards the road bike like that that's my yeah. take agreed donald says what do you think of blood restriction bands oh, i don't even know what that is oh it's when you ban you put a band on your leg and then you, while you're riding it's a, i don't bother i feel like there's so much stuff out there that i need to try <laughs> like so it's not even it's worth like, i i, I, I don't know. no there's just so many more don't. rabbit holes i need to go down <laughs> Warhammer says, what is Jesse's reaction to the police enforcing 30k speed limits in Centennial yeah. Park and now fine cyclists? Uh, I saw that news article, That nothing will change. We've been speeding in Centennial Park for decades and they might go in there for a day and that'll be it. It's ridiculous. Go find fat people for buying and upsizing their McDonald's meal deals with Big Macs and extra fries and fat fests instead of worrying about how people are trying to stay fit. Piss off. It's pretty rad. Done. Carl Nyman, what are your opinions regarding training intensity distribution? Okay, it's a bit long. I know Jesse commented on this, this video of the hierarchy of training, and noted that the most important thing is actually do the training. However, for someone 12 to 16 hours a week to train, am I better awarded for for doing polarized approach or pyramidal or sweet spot intensity distribution? Blah blah blah. I use Trainer Road. I follow their polarized plan. Okay. Um, the pro- the problem with so anyone this is the thing like anyone could answer this you just go and look up a, a a systematic review on training intensity distributions and their effectiveness and anyone that's not even a coach could give you an answer but that's not that's that's not what's important generally with at least from like what I do as a coach it's more about how that's applied to an individual because you send someone on one club ride a week good luck sticking to a polarized distribution for the week it totally throws it out so it's about for me it's more about look sometimes it applies if someone only trains on their own you can really kind of strictly apply one of those things and like i would say at the moment i'm doing it i'm personally following a pole my, my approach is very polarized so there's that but to me it's more about like the principles of what those distributions um, give. So what's what's the theory behind polarized? The theory behind polarized is 
You do most of your training low intensity where you get those really good aerobic adaptations, capillarization of the muscles and the mitochondria and all that. And then you're, f you're, you're feeling really good for your more intense workout so you can do them at high quality. And you can apply that principle without necessarily sticking strictly to that intensity, right, those guidelines. So that's where you can kind of learn from the models without necessarily strictly applying them. Um, that's my opinion on them. I use a mix. If gen to, 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 to me, polarized training doesn't really work for a lot of people when they're only training like eight hours a week. It's just not enough volume to move the needle and not enough time at intensity. So for those, I, I find sweet spot so, or, or more of a pyramidal approach works well for most of the sort of amateur riders. Um, yeah. Come on, come on, debate the benefits of cyclocross from MC. Benefits of cyclocross. Um, debate? Is there any debate? I mean, I if you can do, if you get, if you can get access to cyclocross races, I'm sure you'd be yeah. a better rider for it. Um, Fitness-wise, it's brutal. Bike handling-wise, it's fantastic. It's just really bad for your ego. <laughs> yeah. Really bad for your ego. <laughs> like, that's the biggest issue. Great. Have you ever done a cyclocross race? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have. Have a look. Uh, have a look at my bike history vlog, Jesse. Yes, I tried. I was lapped by Gary Milbourne a few <laughs> times, and then tried to bunny hop the thing, and the thing. The th the one because he went over it after the 12th time he went past me and then I tried to bunny hop it front wheel hit it <coughs> Chris face plants <laughs> straight down that was the end of my cycle cross career nice well done so yeah we, we love we're big cyclocross fans well behaved Wilson says sea dog that's you Chris <laughs> Guess you're wondering I'm an immediate intermediate cyclist but I don't have a power meter or heart rate monitor I typically judge my progress based on my average speed whenever I go for long endurance rides. Is there an effective or accurate way of measuring progress? Yeah, power meter. Without a power meter or heart rate monitor? No. So is there an effective or accurate way of measuring progress without a power meter and a... Uh, yeah, there is. If you have a climb, that is totally protected from external conditions and you can go and do a maximal, you know, it has to be maximal or an IPE capped effort up there and compare your times. But then even if the temperature changes, your speed will change. So that's, I wouldn't say that's accurate. I'd say it's effective. That's probably the best way. It's, it's funny because like, you know, Accurate in, in comparison to a power meter, everything is, the answer is no, because mm. that's just the case. But like, you know, obviously back in the day, before power meters and before heart rate monitors, I remember asking Jamie Jury about this, like, what did you do? Like, how did you know whether you're on form? And he, his reply was, it depended, he could tell, depending on what gear he was able to push mm -hmm. up a certain climb. That was his like, oh, I'm, I'm getting stronger, I'm getting stronger, because he was able to push a heavier gear mm. going up it. So, yeah, maybe maybe you want to go go old school, try that route. Um, yeah, like a timed climb that has no um, no external factors or if just you race crits, you race, you win a race. Mm -hmm. You're going better. Like, depends what your objectives are, I suppose. I'd say, like, I don't know where this person is from, but, like... I would say don't worry too much about measuring it. Go and get a job or work a second, do something to save up and go and buy a set of Asioma single-sided ones, which are what, 600 bucks Australian, maybe? Yeah. It's like not that much money if you're living in a first world country. I'm sure there's things that would you could do to save up and just so then you just don't have to worry about it. You just have the power meter and you know what you're doing. And it's like if... if you know, if you're riding with no heart rate and no power for the, the fact that you just like no metrics and you're just riding for the fun and the sake of it, then that's totally cool. Mm -hmm. But then don't go looking for a um, an accurate way of measuring your progress because that's what the other things offer you. Do you know what I mean? So, mm. yeah. Yeah. Agreed.
Very good. Okay, Swite says, how many grams of carbs per hour do do you average do average six to eight hour per week amateurs absorb and process compared to pros? Um, I don't know actually. I would be guessing if I answered it. You know, pro, I mean, pros using good products could you know can absorb 120 grams an hour. An amateur using the same products, I don't know actually. Maybe, I don't know. I'd just be guessing, so I don't really see the point in answering it. Um, how do you increase it? Um, train it. Yeah. Consume more carbs during your training. Um, also, an adapter. Uh, this is a bit different, but one of the adaptations to exercise is you get better storage of glycogen. So as you get fitter, you can start your races with a bigger tank of glycogen. So that is helps that true? too. I didn't know that. Yep. Okay. That's good. Um, I probably under eat while training. Okay. That's uh, well. Just eating more carbs on hard train rides increase absorption rate. Um, so it won't be bad. Increase absorption. I would say this is getting a bit into speculative. Yes. I mean, there's there's definitely a trainability to to it in terms of the uptake. So yes. How much is that though? I don't actually know. I haven't really. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, if you're doing hard, long training sessions, it, more carbs is going to be better for the quality of that anyway. And yeah. uh, Moped Tobias. How much training is necessary to become one of the top 10% riders in your area? Ah, okay. What kind of training? Hmm. Top 10%. Wow, that's a quality. How long's a piece of string? So top 10%. So if you look at like a club race, a top 10% would be A grade. Because generally, A grade has lower numbers. So if there's 100 riders at a race, there might be 10 in A grade. Mm -hmm. So what type of, so if we just sort of went from there, how much training to become an A grader? Well, I would know, say- the, just a criterion? Well, yeah, let's, well, let's, let's make some assumptions. Let's say criterion. Okay. An A grader at a, at a Saturday Heffron? Yep. I think you definitely, you, you, you're definitely over, oh. <laughs> I think over 10 for the average riders yeah, needs to be doing more than 10 I'd hours. I'd say 10 to 12. Yep. yep. What kind of training? Um, let's say, a, let's, you know, probably two intense sessions per week and then maybe one race. No more than that in terms of hard sessions. And then the rest is just, yep, Ks. Mm -hmm. As the, in the most general thing. But the sad thing is there, it depends on you know, unfortunately, there are riders that will do that and won't be able to get to an A-grade level. Genetics is a yeah. hell of a downside, <laughs> I can tell you that. And what your parents forced you to do when you were a kid, unfortunately. Thankfully, I thank my parents now because I've done sport my entire life and I was forced to go do the bay run as a kid with my dad. And uh, yeah, I do think I benefit a lot from that now, so. And I probably pay for waddling in off eight steps and <laughs> throwing down a few leggies didn't quite give me the uh, basis of an athletic career. That's my excuse anyway. Yes. So the, th the, the, the unfortunate thing is we can say 10 to 12. It, there might be another rider out, out there that needs to do 14 to 16 if they want to get to that level because they just don't have that endurance background. And that's all the VO2 max naturally. That's the system. That's, the, that's why sports. Brutal. Andrew says, non-attendance at Wollongong World Champs. Chris, why didn't you go? Didn't want to. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Well, I was intending to go on the Saturday to see the to see the ladies with with the girls, but with the way the weather was, um, Kira wasn't well on the day anyway. So, yeah, just never happened. Yep. I was down earlier in the week doing some stuff with full gas down at the stand and that kind of thing. So it was kind of another another thing to go down to do. So I saw some of the juniors. But yeah, the, the Sunday race, just, um, yeah, preferred to spend the day with the family, to be honest. Yep, uh, I would say I was similar. I didn't go because I wanted to watch the entire race on TV. And I was also training on those days. I didn't want to interrupt my training because I'm a weirdo like that. Uh, Ryan says, hey, both. Hey, Ryan. Hello. <laughs> I have recently had my 
Oh, that's the same question. The guy that had the child and he's doing right. his commuting, he's killing cool. it, just keep it up. Cool, cool. Uh, good one too says, how long is a piece of string? Yep. Yep. No, Did you're it? right. That's, yeah, it's that good. Is... No, that's true. I tell ya. It had it. That's Seven, actually kind of like freaking eight, me out. He 12. predicted that would be, we would say how long is a piece of string. Mm -hmm. And we said it. Mm -hmm. And now we've asked the question. Yep. Wow. Good one. Slow clap there. Gold mask. That's... that's <laughs> Uh, Blake says, one thing you could change about Oz Cycling. <laughs> um, one thing. It'd be really nice. It would be really nice if they would support through their own networks and their own reach, their own race series. That, for me, would be one thing. A very simple change that would be would have been very, very helpful. To not have to generate your own content all the time from an event that was essentially their event. And they've got a lot of reach, at least on Instagram. And that would have been very helpful to be able to take that to a sponsor, a partner, and say, hey, look, look at this race we're doing that's going out on this big governing bodies channel and it's being talked about and built up and promoted and everyone knows about it. That's what would have been really nice. Um, I would change, I'd go back in time two years to when they cleaned house with all their social media and st stopped them doing it. So they, they deleted the National Road Series, all the social media. They had that, NRS had its own Instagram and Facebook page. So if you were a fan of the NRS, you could follow it. They deleted them. And they also deleted all the, um, most of the state related stuff is gone. So it's everything mountain bike road, it's all through one Instagram page, which makes no sense because it makes it impossible to follow anything because you're scrolling through just cyclocross crap if you're trying to find the road races. Not that I, we love cyclocross, but it'd be nice if they still had those individual channels to follow. I think that was, that was just yeah. dumb. It's, re it's really hard to, to promote and try and get money from sponsors from events that are invisible and they're invisible unless you make content about them you know so. Jim Jim BB says uh, Chris can you do more Fashion Friday videos they were always fun to watch and I got yeah. five thumbs up that, co that comment yeah definitely okay 100% I don't know I kind of felt with that like people were the comments were tended to be pretty negative like people saying oh this is just a snob talking about like how like expensive gear is and stuff like that, but which was never obviously the, the point of it. So um, I don't know. I don't know if me just talking about like I probably need someone else on there as well to like bounce off because otherwise it just sounds like me preaching. Mm. But yeah, people obviously liked it. Yeah, all right. got, got thumbs up. Uh, Tim says, "Hey, Chris and Jesse. Hey, Tim. Got any recommendations for Grand Fondos in New South Wales, particularly for a newbie to?" Looking for big cycling events. Um, well, this one. Yep. Uh, any of the classics. So, Bowel Classics is a good one. A good, a good, probably more intermediate one. It doesn't have any massive climbs, so it's hard all day. But it's it's a bit more uh, appealing from that from that regard. If riding up to Paris, it kind of freaks you out. Um, even from, I mean, Mudgy is easier. Mudgy Classic is probably easy, is easier it's, than Barrel. Yeah, so probably, the, if you're doing your first one, probably start at Mudgy just to get a taste of it. And then the new one, which they did last year, was is a Snowy Classic, which is my favourite. Oh, it's, that's the epic. Yeah, it's, that's the uh, marquee. What's the marquee fondo in Australia? Is it it's Snowy peaks. or is it Peaks? Peaks. It's, it's peaks, peaks Challenge. It's definitely, even for people in New South Wales, it's Peaks Challenge. But the problem I have with Peaks Challenge, as we kind of mentioned before, is it, it's almost too long. Like it is, it's amazing from a, like a one, train for it, you know, once and, and that. But most of the classics we do here in New South Wales are all, um, you know, five to, to maybe seven hours yeah. sort of length. It's yeah. more achievable than training for something that's 11 hours long. It's like, oh God. Now, I don't know about the future of La Tap uh, at this stage. I'm still waiting to hear about that. Um, and there's a, look, there's other things that we haven't done, like the, the gong ride, and I think there's the Bobo Classic and all these sort of things which, which exist. All but, the charity rides. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Any rec- yeah, just look up the, all the, any of the classics are good. They're always really well run and roads are full, roads are closed. Fitz's yeah. challenge, I know it's I know it's ACT, but Fitz's challenge is some um, really good events down there. I was actually what do that this year. Have a look. Some of the distances on that one. Are oh, it's a two fifty five with like in like five an and Alpine. Yeah, yeah, it's like Alpine New South Wales. And you know you'll go down to the ACT and there'll be like just these so many like ACT mountain men riders who are like yeah two fifty five on a Sunday. <laughs> All right, there and back. <laughs> what? All uh, right. So let's go. Next one we have C Zex Sexon seventy four. Have you found those two girls from Matches Hotel? <laughs> no. Funnily enough, I don't even think that made the mainstream media here. Like it was just like, well, no. oh no, it did. I did it. Oh, they loved it. Oh, oh yeah, it. cyclist abusing kids. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ezek no. Wheel, why do you not hate GCN more? Oh, hang on, we've got a, we've got a, uh, we've got a barrel rider. If you are driving a Holden, no, what is it? It looks like a. See, we, we really don't have good car knowledge, no, do we? Car knowledge. It's a Volkswagen Amarok. It's an Orbeer and Specialized family. If you are an Orbeer and Specialized family, shout with the beard. Go on, Howdy. Um Why do you not hate GCN more? I think that is taking the piss. I love, I love GCN. Yeah, the I actually got spent, back to watch Yeah, it. I'm on GCN Race Pass. GCN, the tri- triathlon channel. Yeah, I really enjoyed that during Kona. Great videos. Um, I will just, say, just, I just, can I just, just say on the GCN channel. thing, right? Oh like, God, why do we... Why? why? Every video. Like, it's... <laughs> It, it really did shock me, like, how defensive people got about it. Like, like that we were having a go at their children for merely saying that the content could be better. Like, I don't know, I just... Maybe it comes back to cyclists being a little... Don't take the bait. In, just don't take it. Oh, my God. Oh, I, anyway, let's just yeah. let's leave that one. Sang Chu. Hi, Chris. Thank you for the contents. The contents. Uh, you have been now. doing. They are really helpful and enjoyable. Uh, what can be the best recovery method after an intense training ride? Great question. Right. So, actually, I've actually brought mine with me. I am a big fan of the Theragun. Yep. Big fan. Mm-hmm. And, like, borderline obsessed with it. I, I, gen- I honestly think it makes a difference. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I will. I'll pull it out before before bed, most nights. Yeah. I brought my eBay gun with me too. Did you? Yeah, yeah. No, I just braid it. I, yeah, I know when I haven't used it. Mm-hmm. I like to grow my fitness. So this is following on. I like to grow my fitness and am riding about ten to twelve hours a week, mostly mostly endurance. Yeah, I know that I need to do some intervals. However, I feel exhausted for a few days after every training session. Mm. That can make my weekly hours. That I then I can't make my weekly hours until I become fit again. Uh, okay, let's go. Firstly, you may not be eating enough Feeling and you're getting mind. just fatigue on that. Mm-hmm. You may also, if you're doing a, like a three-hour endurance ride and it's wiping you out, you, I mean, you could be have some sort of, uh, you might be, you know, you, to me, that's like you, something's not right. I, Maybe a blood test or that's, you shouldn't be... You know. I'd argue you're not actually riding endurance. I'd argue you're riding probably hard. Like you, if you looked at the power profile of, the, of those rides you're doing, I reckon there's some some tempo threshold spikes in it. You know, it's not a pure endurance ride, and you may be pay, maybe paying for that as well. Um, Possibly. Yep. So yeah, make sure you're doing an actual zone two ride, as you said you're doing. So double check that. Make sure you're eating enough. How many grams of carbs are you eating per hour? Are you eating carbs before and after? If you're doing all that and it's still wiping you out, you may have, you know, there may be something more wrong with you. You should get checked out. Because that doesn't sound, to me that doesn't, if this was someone's I was coaching and they said that, I'd be, I'd be pretty worried. Okay. Lucy says... But right, just quickly, riding 10 to 12 hours a week, like training, like that, if this person hadn't had a background in this and is just suddenly starting to do it, like... That's quite a lot of training, right? Yeah. So this might be, this is what it's like. But so they're like, trying to do ten to. Oh, that's a. I know that's a very good point, Chris, because like, they're trying to do ten to twelve, and yeah. sometimes they can't hit that. 
So maybe that is too much. Yeah, yeah. that could be just too much. Like, if, especially if you're relatively new to the sport, that's a lot of, like, that's basically what I'm doing. And how are you splitting that up? If it's 12 hours over three rides a week, that's pretty demanding. Maybe try and just take, just take two rest days a week and ride five days a week mm-hmm. to get the hours. So yeah, that's why it's very hard to answer those sorts of questions. Uh, Lucy says, modern road racers train more than they race. Okay, why? Competitive, co- competitive competitors require competition. Enlighten me, you new gens. Train more than they race. Ah, uh, I don't know, like pros, a pro might have like 60, 50 or 60 race days in a year. So they're still training more, but that's a lot of if you added up the, the training stress from those 60 days of racing compared to the training stress out of that, it's a lot of racing. Mm. Um, I don't think there's a generic rule for that. I mean, yes, guys like Primoz Roglic, you've definitely seen have moved away from big race days and, and prefer the, the training camp type thing. Um, now you can be a bit cynical about that and say what's going on at the training camps and that's potentially a discussion we can have for a different day. But... Um, that clearly works for him. Um, coming back to the chap I was saying about Bob Youngles, Bob Youngles is the opposite. He's a race days man. Needs the race days, can't get the training done the same way. I know Valverde was the same with, with the lockdown stuff, really struggled coming out of that because he wasn't getting the race days and needed, the, needed that and couldn't train himself fit. So I think it's a bit of a... Um, Depends. Whatever yeah. works for you type thing piece of string um, but like I think like triathlon and stuff like that like they have so few race days even like a an age grouper mm-hmm. like might only do like two races a year mm. and that's and the rest is all training so there's, there's but the race because the race is so much more static than yeah. a, the bike race bike yeah. racing is so dynamic it's yeah. like you can't it's so difficult to prepare for um, right. but then it is on the same thing it's difficult to prepare for prepare for but training can be more effective than racing just from in terms of physiology. So it's, yeah, it's a balance. All right, we've got 10 minutes, Jesse. Why are you not sponsored by Develle anymore? Um, financial reasons, um, yeah. Um, again, read between the lines what you want, but the team's $40,000 behind on this year, which I've had to fund, and that is due to certain people not paying. Yep. Uh, Stephen says, do you get the same training adaptations doing long rides on bike loops, so like what I'm doing at Centennial Park, than doing it on the road and going to different places to ride? Can you explain the pros and cons of the two? Okay. Physiology-wise, they're mostly the same. I would say I'm missing out on some of the... (laughs) Okay, how is this? Not very, very scientific, but... Centennial Park is very smooth, very smooth road surface. So I get really good stimulus aerobically, but muscular wise, I am not getting, I'm not getting good at absorbing the bumps and dealing with all that roughness and fluctuations that come from a road ride. So um, I will, as we get more into summer, I will be going purposefully going out of Centennial Park for some of my longer rides because yes, there is a conditioning element that comes from riding on bumpier, rougher roads that I'm not getting by riding around on hot mix for four hours. We, we had this discussion the other week where we went for a four, four five hour ride south mm-hmm. and both of us were fucked. The yep. end of us, end of it. Our, I'd felt like I'd been, you know, put through the ringer Whereas I can do a four-hour ride in Centennial Park and be fatigued, but certainly not the same. That, right, like you said, that kind of muscular ache mm-hmm. that you can get. Yeah, that's interesting. So, I never thought about that. Yeah, so pro pros of the park is you can really target specifically when you want to improve, and it's very easy to get the hours done. Cons, you're missing out on that muscular sort of side of things, so you have to be careful. Uh, Mark says, hey gents, how do you, uh, is there any value in training with a 15 kilo bike with mud guards, seven gears, front suspension, and then racing on a 6.1 and seven kilo bike? I rate it. I rate it. Now, it depends what your mindset is because like I would go through phases of loving that setup, especially like I'm doing the bike path rides and that kind of stuff. Just like, yeah, I'm riding this real hard clunker. It's making me strong, all the rest of it. 
and I, I absolutely rate it. You just get the training done. The problem is then you get on the really light bike and you're like, oh, I don't want to go back on that other thing. And yeah, you, you sort of put that away. But from a, I, I don't know if there's any training benefit to it, but yeah, I, I like the, the option of doing it and I will definitely continue to do it. Yeah. Uh, Especially to live like somewhere with shit weather, like seemingly Sydney now. Yeah. But yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Is there a benefit? Yes. Given on the, if you're doing the same loop, you're going to be able to hold the higher, steadier power on a heavier bike, slower bike. It's just going to be going slower. That's why I ride the gravel bike. Um, TH24GG1 says, how should you fool a Grand Fondo if you want to go all out staying with the front group? Go to my channel. I did a video on it last night showing what I'm eating on Sunday. Yep. I'll put the link in the description. Or... Um, Dan Tuba says, what does your family think of your cycling obsession? <laughs> now, Dan, <laughs> I read this comment and because it's not for me to answer, it's for my family to answer. So I got their thoughts. Now, you're lucky that Elizabeth... Elizabeth didn't take kindly to this question because she doesn't like the concept that you're suggesting she allows me to do anything. That's not how our relationship works. That said, that said, I did ask Catherine and Kira and I've recorded their answer. See why he likes riding his bike? Because I like to ride my bike as well, but I don't really get a chance to ride it with him because he's usually away. Uh, what about if Dad was obsessed with something else? Like, um, what about, would it be better if Dad was obsessed with, like, Disneyland? Well, we would and be able to go there more often Disney. if you did vlogs at Disneyland. What about if Dad was obsessed with golf? No. You see, how come this question gets asked about cycling but not about golf? Like, golf is somehow more acceptable than the horrific, you know, part of the picture. Well, I don't like person. golf. Oh. <laughs> Whoa! There's a preparation. So you can go to the next one now. Yeah. Cool. Um, for me, uh, so, so shitty. Anyway, go on. <laughs> my, uh, my, my job, my entire job is cycling. So, but if I'm not training, it has no really impact on. My, I'm just working a job. But you wouldn't even really to an outsider. They wouldn't know I cycle. Now it's 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 a, it's a lot now because I'm training a lot. But it really depends on how much I'm training versus how much that affects anything. Sam Hill, oh, I think he's, he's got to be trolling us here. <laughs> Sam says, should I do polarized training? A car is bad for you. How do I increase my average speed? <laughs> I think we've covered like every one of those. I think they're yeah. genuinely yeah. good questions. There we go. We got there. Uh, Patrick says, as a competitive cyclist, oh, we're going to have to go quick fire here. As competitive cyclist, has Strava had any impact on your training and riding in general? Yes. Yeah. I love Strava. I'm freaking obsessed with Strava. Yep. It's fantastic. Uh, especially like when I'm down around Berry and stuff like that. Like I love being able to look back at like my segments from like 2016, 2015 and like compare myself to that. Like, oh, totally love it. Motivator. Definitely. Yep. Uh, and then also how do people in Australia follow pro cycling when most of the races are well after midnight on your East Coast? Yep. GCN app. Thank God. Yep. Wake up, open the GCN app and then you put your replays on. Yep. Marcus Velo says, can then... Can we see the Nero boys will Chris at least at Peaks Challenge to restore the pedal gate fail from 2021? <laughs> yeah, I really want to do it. I really want to do it. I need to, um, I need to sort some accommodation out. I don't know. It's probably about that time. Can we get you there? No, thanks. Jeez. It's like, <laughs> he, it's so annoying. Because it's like, I have to follow his ass around Heffron and get my ass handed to me at all these events. And the one thing that I might potentially get a chance is like, oh my God. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Uh... Afif says, how much difference is the carbohydrate needs between smaller and larger riders? I'm 50 kilos, one six centimetres tall. Uh, how, what, how much is the difference? Well, is a big dip. Yeah, there'd be a big difference. Fitter riders need more fuel. So, uh, yeah, you would, you'd be having less. How much? Piece of string? Um, 50 kilos. You know, yeah, maybe you could, you know, you might be fine on 40, 40 grams of carbs an hour. Uh, so I, I don't know. Jordan says, "You said how J Vine's Kuthacom would stand for a long, for a while longer. It fell today. Thoughts? Whoa. What? Who took it? That's a all right. Give me just okay, Chris. I'll get. I'll wow. give you another question. I'm going to look up the segment. J, we okay. So there's uh, hopefully when Jay gets back, he's going to do a nationals prep, and we're going to 
put that on the channel and we're going to follow him around. It should be really, really cool. But I have a feeling we may have to change our goals uh, for the end of season. Nationals is now off the menu and we're going to have to go back to Kuda because that, ladies and gentlemen, is a massive bombshell segments good thing i'm quick on strava all right let's get it it's a santos to it on under challenge mount kutha backside sea details here it comes all time matt greenwood wow. two seconds flag it matt has who's okay so we got kutha kom bailey mcdonald on lead out duties Okay, right. Wow. I've never heard of Matt Greenwood. Matt Greenwood, you've just announced yourself. His profile is on private. Well, I can't... Give yeah, that man a contract. Follow, but I can't see activities. Let's go. I need my laptop. This is... I can't do anything yeah. on my phone. I think we, we end it with this yeah. bombshell. Jesse, this is... That's a massive bombshell. 473 watts. <laughs> Ooh, big power. Big power. Wow, there you go. Yeah. It looks... Legit. I mean... It looks... Was it a Strava power or real power? No, it was real power. Uh, shit, looks legit. There you go. It actually looks right. legit. On you, Matt. Matt Congrats. Greenwood. Oh, let's just do a... Let's go Instagram store. Who, who is this guy? Uh, we're going to finish it up, man. Let's finish it up. All right. All right. We have arrived in Barrel. Uh, guys, if you are around here, do um, fire us a message. Actually, don't fire us a message. Just say hello because we'll be in the bunch tomorrow doing our thing. Cool. You got anything else? No, that's it. No. All right. Peace. Subscribe. Like. Check this out. Okay.